If you could take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to be looking particularly this evening at verses 16 and 17. And uh, the title of the sermon, Living by the Word. Living by the Word. We're going to read from verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3. From verse 12 through to verse 17, but our focus is on verses 16 and 17. God's word reads as follows. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's just bow our heads together in prayer. Our gracious Lord, as we turn out to your word, please guide us. Please fill us with your spirit. May these not be merely words or mere intellectual exercise, Lord, as we study your word. Lord, we want our hearts to be transformed by the grace of the gospel and by the power of your spirit. Lord, help us as we seek to do that this evening for your glory and honor. Amen. Just by way of introduction, we are continuing our study on the daily practical Christian life. The daily practical Christian life. And I do hope that as we've gone through this, uh, the study in Colossians chapter 3, that you have had at least some sense of the practical nature of the gospel to life and how it applies to life in every day. Now, what we've been dealing with thus far, particularly as we've gotten through the introductory parts of Colossians chapter 3, uh, particularly from verse 12, what we find is that Paul is addressing the character of Christians. In other words, what is your character? What is your attitude towards people around you or life? What, is your, what are the quality characteristics that mark us as Christians? And remember, Paul is addressing the church here. He's speaking to the community of believers. And he's saying these qualities, these character qualities, are to mock those who have been transformed by the gospel. In other words, because of the grace of the gospel, because of the work on the cross, and because you have understood your sinful nature before God, and that it is only by grace through faith that you are saved, by repentance and confession of sin and trust in Jesus Christ, there is a radical transformation that takes place in our thinking. Our attitude in life is different because we are Christians, because of what Christ has done for us. And so that's the context of here. And verses 12 through 17 really is focusing on these quality, character, quality characteristics. He says, you are God's holy people. You're holy and dearly loved. So clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And so all of these things are to mark us as believers. And this evening, we get to kind of the end of this section where Paul is addressing believers and, and how they are to conduct themselves before he will delve into the very practical which is how we are to relate to one another as Christians. In other words, how are our relationships with one another to be radically different in light of the gospel and in light of the fact that we are clothing ourselves with these quality characteristics? That's what Paul is speaking to here. And as he comes towards the end of this teaching or this section, he says in verse 16 that we are to let the word of Christ dwell richly in you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And so the first main point that I want us to see from this, these two verses is that we are to be shaped by the word. We are to be shaped by the word. And this is really what verse 16 speaks about. And that's what I've just dealt with. And there's two things that we see from this in verse 16. We see firstly that we are to be filled with Christ. As Christians, we are to be filled with Christ. He begins there by saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you 
richly. Now, the first thing that I want to say about that is that there is a corporate responsibility here. When Paul writes, the word of Christ must dwell richly in you, the you there is plural. He's speaking to the church as a body. He's speaking to us in, as a community of faith. We are to be marked as a community of faith with the evidence that the word of Christ is dwelling in us richly. In other words, that the word of Christ is shaping us and is directing us and is shaping who we are and what we are as a people. We're going to delve a little bit more into that. Now, obviously, there are personal implications and applications of that. If the word of Christ is going to dwell richly among us as a corporate body, as the body of Christ, it needs to dwell richly within us as individuals. Uh, if we have an individual that does not have Christ, you can imagine they're not going to be shaped by the word. And so we all need to be shaped by Christ individually so that that can overflow and have a corporate application. So let us then consider what he says here. He says that the word of Christ is to dwell in you richly. Notice there that he's speaking about this word of Christ. And what is the word of Christ? I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all answer. The first thing that we can say about it is it is the word from Christ. In other words, it is that which Christ taught. Back in chapter 3 and verse 15, that was what we looked at last week, uh, he said that the peace of Christ is to be among us, is to rule us. Let the peace of Christ rule you. Okay, And the peace of Christ which is, is the peace that comes from Christ. Uh, this word from Christ is, is the word that comes from him. It is referring thus in this sense to all that Jesus taught as he went about his earthly ministry. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, we read that Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And further on in chapter 11 and verse 1 of Matthew, we read, When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Friends, teaching and preaching was the hallmark of the ministry of Christ. Teaching is essential. It is critical. And, and Christ's ministry, although it was authenticated and supported by miraculous works, which were wonderful, the essence was he needed to teach people the truth of God, the revelation of God, the nature of man, the scenario with man losing relationship with God. All of these things that mark the gospel were being taught, and it comes through the word. When Christ was preparing to depart from this world and ascend into heaven, he knew his crucifixion was coming, and he prepared his disciples by telling them that as he would depart from them, a comforter would come, the Holy Spirit. And what would be the ministry of the Holy Spirit? The ministry of the Holy Spirit would be to teach them all the words of Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. In John 16, 13, just a little bit later on, Jesus repeated, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. What's the ministry of the Holy Spirit among God's people? Primarily, fundamentally, it is to apply the truth of God's word to the people of God. So he would come and remind them of the words that Jesus was teaching. And so there is this emphasis on the teaching of Jesus. Now, some people would leave uh, this teaching over here at, at what I've just said in terms of uh, the word of Christ. They say, let the word of Christ dwell in you. It's what Jesus taught. But we need to move beyond that. This is not merely the word of Christ, but this is the word about Christ. This is the word about Christ. All that the scriptures teach concerning Christ. And who is Jesus Christ? How is he referenced? John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Right? Jesus Christ is the very word of God. In other words, he came as the full and perfect revelation of God and the fulfillment of all God's purposes. In other words, everything pointed towards Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, uh, God, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Jesus Christ, the Logos, the Word, he comes as the revelation of God. He's come to teach us who God is, the character, the nature of God. And keep in mind, everything that Paul is teaching over here in terms of our quality characteristics, what we are to be marked by, comes out of who Jesus was, as he revealed the character and nature of God. Remember, our journey through from sin to glory is one of transformation into Christ's likeness that was lost at the fall. And so this is what Christ is bringing across. He's revealing God, and he's speaking God, and he's teaching this, the manner, the way of God, and, and all God's purposes throughout salvation history. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15 through 17, we find that Jesus is the fullness of the revelation of God. Paul writes there, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. God wants us to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And where does that come from? It comes from Christ, the teaching of the word. Now, with that in mind, where do we find this revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of God? It's in the scriptures, right? It's in the scriptures. In Luke chapter 24, verse 25 through 27, Jesus on the road to uh, Emmaus, uh, the uh, the disciples were walking there, and Jesus had been crucified, and they weren't aware that he had been resurrected. And they were talking about this grand event, and in a sense, sorrowful. And Jesus walks with them, and he, he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Dear friends, the, the scriptures, and he's speaking there of the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures were pointing towards Jesus. They were focusing on the Savior that was coming, the Messiah. And all of that led up and built up to a fulfillment in Christ. And Christ came as the perfect revelation of God and his work. And he revealed it in his life before the world. And as he, and as he died and was resurrected, he gave this message of the gospel that was focused again on him. And that was committed into writing in the New Testament. And friends, we have the scriptures which reveal that. So what should we learn from this? Well, the word of Christ refers to the entirety of scripture, particularly as it is focused upon the person and work of Jesus Christ, who is the full revelation of God. Now that means that the entirety of the Old Testament, the entirety of the New Testament, is to be taken and learned. Okay, Notice what he goes on to say. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right? The word is to fill our lives. It is to fill us. As a church, we are to be characterized and marked by a growing knowledge and application of the word. Now, let me read Colossians 3, 16 and 17 again. And then we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 18 through 21. And I want to show you the connection over here. Uh, verse 16 and 17 says, Colossians 3, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Okay, let me pause there. Learn read verse 17. Go across to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 through 21. Paul writes, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father. The thanks to God the Father in Colossians 3 comes in verse 17. Now, what's the connection over there? These are parallel verses. And in Colossians 3, he's saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then he goes into the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In Ephesians 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit. 
singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, uh, being filled with the Spirit and letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, are parallel. And so what Paul is saying over here is, we need to have this Word, the Word of Christ, the Scriptures, fill us. That is the means that the Spirit fills us as He brings that truth to uh, uh, bear in our lives, and, and He gives us an understanding of that. Friends, the Word of God is the means that God uses to sanctify and to save, well, to save and to sanctify His people. We are a people of the Word. This is fundamental. Now, some thoughts on this. Firstly, let me just read the comment here by Douglas Moo. He says, Richly suggests that this constant reference to the Word of Christ should not be superficial or passing, but that it should be a deep and penetrating contemplation that enables the message to have transforming power in the life of the community. Let me get to the thoughts that I have on this. And the first thought is that growth, our growth as a church and individually, comes through knowing God through his word. D.L. Moody wrote this. He said, I prayed for faith and thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. One day, I read in the 10th chapter of Romans, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I had closed my Bible and prayed for faith. I now opened my Bible and began to study, and faith has been growing ever since. You see, friends, when we, when we pray to God and we say, God, increase my faith. God, make me holy. God, please um, give me wisdom from your um, from above, give me that wisdom in my circumstances and in how to deal with these circumstances. We cannot pray those things and then leave the word of God closed. He will not give us the wisdom. He will not give us the faith because we're not going to him to receive it through the means that he has given. The word of Christ must dwell in us richly. And so let me ask you, friends, do you open your Bible regularly in order to learn? Do you open your Bible regularly? Do you have a hunger for the Word of God? Is there a joy for you to open the Word of God? And do you open the Word of God expectantly in anticipation of seeing and knowing God and saying, I want to know more of God and this is where I'm going to find it. And God will reveal that to you as you open the Scriptures. But taking that a step further, we require time and meditation in the Word of God. George Muller said, Now what is food for the inner man? Not prayer, but the word of God. And here again, not the simple reading of the word of God, so that it only passes through our minds just as water passes through a pipe, but considering what we read, pondering it over, and applying it to our hearts. We need time in this, dear friends. We need to sit and Read, yes, broad reading of Scripture is great. If you can read through the Bible in a whole year, that's wonderful. But if you're doing that and not able to slow down a little bit and meditate on portions and passages of Scripture and just really let it sink in and chew on it and, and think about how does this apply and how does this relate to other Scriptures and, and, and how, what do other people say about this and, and go to one or two places where you can read on what other people say. We have wonderful resources online, commentaries from faithful, godly men that can, we can use to help us. But friends, we need this time. And I know that sometimes we, we struggle with time, and I, I say this often here, but I think it's important that we get reminded of this. You know, I was thinking in the context of, um, of, of the world and, and education, and if you work in corporate uh, society, and or if you if you work as a an engineer, I know the engineering world because that's my background. Uh, when you're an engineer, you can study for four years and you can get your engineering degree, and then when you go into the engineering world, you need to spend hours with what's called continuing professional development (CPD points). So you're going to attend a course here, you're going to attend another course, and you've got to keep on developing, you've got to keep on growing. And I thought to myself, calculated it. We spend four years studying for a degree to go into the world and to make our mark on this world and to fill the earth and subdue it, which is a godly thing. Okay? I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. It's wonderful when we can do that. 
But that works out to some 7,200 hours of study, roughly, on my little calculations. Now, if you only spend one Sunday, one sermon on a Sunday, and sit under the teaching of the Word over here, you know that it will take you 138.5 years to do the equivalent of a degree of four years. That's if you say, I'm going to come to a Sunday service and I'm going to learn at the Sunday morning service and I'll spend an hour in the church. Well, it'll take 138 years to learn what a person learns in four years at university. Now, I'm not saying that we have to spend more time in the Bible than we do getting a university qualification or spending time at work because we don't have so many hours in a day. But the Word of God is so fundamental to our life and how we live our lives that we need to spend extensive time in it. We need to make that time because ultimately all of it is pointing towards eternity. And what we do in this world is to be done with a view to eternity and can only be done that way as we study the Word. So, my challenge to you, how much study are you doing in the Word of God? And are you spending time in the Word? Is, is it meaningful to you? Let me encourage you. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly within you. Uh, and I know we're all busy. It's, it's not a, a criticism of you, please. But it's an encouragement. It's an exhortation. Go and make a meaningful effort towards saying, I'm going to spend time in this Word. Uh, because Satan's going to want to drag me away from that. Right. And, and finally, in terms of these observations, we need all of Scripture. We need all of Scripture. We don't just need the New Testament. We don't just need the Psalms in the New Testament or the Psalms, Proverbs, wisdom literature in the New Testament. We need all of Scripture. A.W. Tozer said, The Word of God, will, well understood and religiously obeyed, is the shortest route to spiritual perfection. And we must not select a few favorite passages to the exclusion of others. Nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian. Now, I know that the prophets are difficult to understand. When I read through Ezekiel in my daily quiet times, where I am currently, it's hard to understand Ezekiel. When you go to Leviticus and you read the laws and the regular, it's difficult to understand. But again, we have resources available. And sometimes we need to take that step forward and say, Lord, please help me to understand these things and find some resources that can help you. And let's delve into Scripture. And, and in terms of the preaching from the pulpit of the church, um, not just me, but whoever's leading whatever church you're in, they should be preaching the whole counsel of God, which, by the way, is Emmanuel Baptist Church slogan, proclaiming the whole counsel of God. And we need that. Now, the church is not here to give motivational speeches. The church rather is to be marked by an increasing knowledge among God's people in the Word of God. That is what is to mark us. The Word of Christ is to fill us. And it is to shape how we live. All of those character qualities that have been mentioned, everything that is said there, that all comes through the Word. All right? Secondly, the second main sub-point under this main point is that we are to be proclaiming Christ. And I'll be a little bit more brief on this, um, but we are to be proclaiming Christ. Again, in verse 16, we read, Let the word of Christ, sorry, let me go to my translation that's um, the one that most of you will be using. It says, Therefore, um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. There are two things involved here, uh, two, two elements involved. There's teaching and there's admonishing. Teaching is the simple proclamation and presentation of the truth of God's word. It's an orderly uh, arrangement of truth and an effective communication of it. As the teaching goes, so goes the church. It's important. Then we have admonishing. That, in a sense, refers to the somewhat more negative warning about the dangers of straying from the truth. We need admonishment. Admonishing has the element of strong encouragement. It is generally practical and moral rather than abstract or theological. But let me say that it all goes hand in hand. We need the theological but we need it applied to life. We need the deep truths, but we need to see the implications of those truths and why they're so important for us to live. And so we need to delve into these things. And what Paul is saying here is, you as the body, us, 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And that's the next important thing. Who's doing the teaching and the admonishing? The pastor, yes. The elders, yes. But that's not what he says here. He says, one another. We are teaching one another. And let me say to you that we are all counselors. The question is, are we good counselors or are we not good counselors? Are we counseling scripture and what that which is sort of based and shaped by the word? Or are we being led astray by philosophies that are not from the word or by our own thinking? And we need to learn to go to the word and say, I want to counsel with the word of God. And that's why it's so important that I am grounded and rooted in the word. Because God's word is what we need for life and godliness. So we are to do this for one another. The whole church is involved. And it's not merely in the proclamation from the pulpit. Because not everyone is going to come stand in the pulpit. It's in our interactions. It's when we meet over a meal. It's when we hear of someone's problems or struggles. And we can go and counsel them or give them advice or help them. But this is the ministry of the church. And then the means involved. And this is quite interesting. There's been a little bit of debate over this because he says, teaching and admonishing one another, uh, in verse 16 in the NIV says, and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude. Now, the NASB, for example, says, with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Okay. Now, what is it? Is it using psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to teach and admonish one another? Or is it that and that? And, and there's a lot of debates. I'm not going to delve into it. I want to focus on the fact that the word of Christ is to be front and center in the church. And there is to be psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, for the most part, commentators would agree, refers to the psalms. Hymns is hymns about God, hymns of praise to God. And it can refer to various hymns. Some of those hymns are found in the New Testament. I don't think this is all referring to the Psalms, that we must only sing the Psalms in church. And some believe that. I don't believe that it is. And spiritual songs speaks of all manner of songs that convey spiritual truth. But what's important? The whole thrust of Colossians 3.16 is the Word of God. In other words, our singing itself, even as we use that to teach, because it is a teaching mechanism within the church. And, and Scripture is full of the fact that we are to teach with preaching uh, uh, you know, from the pulpit. So we don't need to say, well, we can only do one or the other. We can use it all. But our songs are teaching mechanisms. And through them, we will teach doctrine. And it will either be good doctrine or not so good doctrine. And so we want to say, are we singing good songs and hymns and spiritual songs? And are they rooted and grounded in the truth of the word? And are they conveying that truth? And it's not so much focused on man-centered, which is what a lot of singing is today. It's Christ-exalting. It's God-focused. And yes, we can sing praises to God. And we have to do that, as Paul goes on to write, with all wisdom. Again, that is the wisdom of God. It is word-centered. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, and knowledge of beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's Proverbs 9, verse 10. And so that wisdom is grounded there, but it's also with a wise presentation of the truth. And friends, we need to be wise counselors as we teach this truth of God to one another. We need to be sensitive to one another. We need to understand each other. We need to teach God's word with wisdom. Many people teach the word of God or can convey the word of God in a very unhelpful manner. And then the attitude involved, singing with gratitude in your hearts. And the, the, the literal phrase in the Greek there is singing in his grace. And to that, I will read the words of one commentator who says, Christian singing is to be in the realm of grace. Some have interpreted the construction to mean something like singing gratefully unto the Lord. However, in light of Paul's insistence on the realm of grace as the believer's hope of salvation, a better interpretation is that the phrase refers to hearty Christian singing, singing with an understanding of grace because of the work of grace in the life. Grace reminds singers that the message and not the singers bring salvation. It further reminds them that everything good about which they sing 
becomes because of God's grace. There is no room for self-praise, ambition, or high-mindedness in the realm of grace. Those who sing do so because they have felt the transforming power of God in their lives, and they sing with an awareness of that grace. That is how we are to sing in the church, brothers and sisters, with an awareness of the grace of God. Very secondly, and I've taken all of our time just on the first point. <laughs> I'll be very brief here. But secondly, we are to be living by the word. And this is verse 17. Paul ends this section, and this is really just a summary of all that he said, particularly from verse 12. He says there, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Notice what Paul is addressing. He's saying, whatever you do, whatever you as a church do, Whatever you do as those who are loved by the Lord, everything in, in what you say, in the deeds that you do, let it be shaped by Jesus Christ. Let it be shaped by Him. It must be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? It means according to His will. It is under His authority. It is by His direction. It's in His name. Right? It's not just, I've said this many times, it's not just in the name of, in the name of, and we say anything we want in the name of Jesus and think it's going to happen. No, it's according to his will. Right? We are to live a life that is according to the will of our Savior. One commentator writes this, The person of Jesus was everything to them, and because of grace, all of life was to be a contribution to him. His authority and reputation concerned them. They were to do nothing apart from His direction, approval, and purposes. Living in accord with His name means in harmony with His revealed will, in subjection to His authority, in dependence on His power. That is what is to mark us as Christians, all in the name of Christ. And then he ends the, the section again, giving thanks. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This idea of thanks began back in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. And what did he say there? Uh, Give thanks to God the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. In other words, that thanksgiving is rooted in salvation and the work of God through Christ. In other words, our salvation is so grand and glorious that it moves us to thanksgiving. It moves us to live life for God. But this is not a burdensome life. It's not a drudgery. It's a joyous life of thanksgiving. Again, another commentator says, Thanksgiving is not a dutiful drudgery, but a celebration of the freedom to live, worship, and work with Jesus as Lord. Thankfulness to God the Father blossoms out of the soil of dependence and humility. That's where our thankfulness to God comes from. Dear friends, just in closing, a couple of words of application. Firstly, the word of Christ must dwell richly within us. That goes obviously beyond us having a copy of the Bible. It even goes beyond reading the Bible. It goes to, let me read this in submission to God, to know his ways, to know his will, asking him for that. Every thought, every action, every reaction in our lives as Christians must be shaped by the word, by Christ. As a church, our collective thought and motivation must be that the word of God or the word concerning Christ is central. And friends, that must be seen within our ministries in this church. All of the ministries of the church, our, our real focus is on the word and how to apply that word to our lives. This is not superficial word. It's not a passing comment or an allusion to the gospel. It's really saying, let's see how God speaks into this scenario or this situation or this struggle or this joy. And how do we use the word of God to shape us? Further to this, we are to be about the task of teaching and admonishing one another as a community of faith. We grow as we do that. All of us do. Uh, when I've got to teach someone or admonish, as a pastor even, very often, that's a context for learning for me. I've got to really think about and pray about and search the scriptures. How am I going to help this person? I don't just have all the answers in my head. I really don't. 
it's hard and it's, sometimes it's a lot of hard work. And so, friends, we need to all be doing that. And then we need to share our concerns and our problems and our struggles and our joys and our failures so that people can speak into our lives. We said that earlier this morning at our meeting. But we are to having, have this word mark our lives and to shape our lives. And friends, let me encourage us. Uh, next week we're going to delve into the really more practical day-to-day -day relational things. Husbands and wives, parents and children, bosses and employees. How do they relate to one another? And it's all going to flow out of this. These character qualities need to shape those relationships. So let me encourage you. Be excited about the Word of God. Pray that the Lord would show you his, and reveal His truth to you. And then go and open the Scriptures and study it. And if there's a particular area of struggle, start there. Search the Scriptures. See what God has to say about that. He speaks to you where you are. And He, he applies His Word to where you are. And it is all that we need for life and godliness. And so let us open the Word of God and let us be a people who are shaped by the word of Christ to his glory. Let's pray together. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the truth therein. We thank you for the joy that it is to know about you and your wondrous work of salvation, uh, the glorious gospel. And we pray that we, as your people, would have a deep love for the word, the word that speaks and points towards Jesus Christ as the full and final revelation of you, Father God. And so, Lord, give us that hunger and that thirst for the truth. Uh, give us understanding and insight even as we seek to learn and to grow in our understanding of the truth and our knowledge of the truth. And may we as a church be shaped by Christ and by the truth of Scripture. And, Lord, we know we need your Holy Spirit in order to do that. Please, pour out your Spirit in our midst that we might truly know you that we might be filled with the Spirit and controlled and led and motivated in all that we do by your Holy Spirit so that you would be glorified and honored in our life and in our conduct and in our thoughts and in our deeds. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.